Hello and welcome to Snyder's Return, a tabletop roleplay podcast. My guest today returns to this haven having crossed the Great Parch, the Gilead system, and the Broken World to bring us news of hope, a necromatic city, and new alien threats. She knows her way around a board game and a tabletop roleplay game. It is an absolute pleasure to welcome game designer, TTRPG content creator, warden of DigiSprite, and sage of Cubicle 7, Elaine Lithgow. Elaine, welcome back to the show. My gosh, what an introduction. I wasn't quite expecting that much fanfare, but I will take it. Uh, thank you. I'm glad to be back. <laughs> uh, rightly so. Uh, you, your work is, is stunning, and uh, what I've alluded to there in the introduction we'll, we'll touch on very shortly. But Elaine, for, for those that maybe haven't listened to our uh, previous in, interview, would you like to give us a, a short background on yourself and how you got into tabletop roleplay games, please? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Elaine Lithgow, as mentioned. Um, very, very quick summary of a, a long and storied and woe-filled career. <laughs> Not that full of woe. Um, but uh, yeah, I uh, studied um, video games design originally at university. Um, and I got rocketed out during the um, great big uh, financial downturn uh, for a hot minute there. So that was good fun. Uh, worked in video games for a oh god better part of a decade just mm. over um working on some weird bits and pieces uh, over the years angry birds nonsense like that <laughs> lots of mobile games and uh, then i got into uh, making board games on the side uh, with our uh, small three-person team digi sprite and uh, we did three games so far uh, first one was doomsday bots uh, then we did Adventure Mart, and then we did Familiar Alchemy. So uh, that's been our, our fun little creative uh, board game outlet. Um, and then, gosh, it must have been about three, four years ago now, I started doing some freelance tabletop role-playing game writing for Cubicle 7. Um, and that was just around the time that Soulbound and Wrath and Glory, uh, the two new Warhammer licenses, with Cubicle 7 at the time were being published. So I got in on the core books for those, starter sets, etc. Um, and then I did freelance writing for them for about 18 months, um, which was great fun. Learned a lot very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got brought on full time as a writer. And then over the course of the subsequent year and a half, I went writer, developer, and now producer. So uh, I think I've been in the producer role for a couple of a year now as well, actually. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I've worked uh, on a whole a whole bunch of bits and pieces now uh, yeah. for Cubicle 7, and that sort of takes us up to where we are today. A very abridged history. As mentioned, I think we went into more detail we in the, our previous talk, so I don't want to wax lyrical about it all over again. Well, to save us retreading old ground in, in that respect, uh, and as you mentioned, we, we spoke about it in uh, in more detail previously, but... Uh, moving from where you have been to where we are and where we're going next, uh, one of the exciting things that you're a part of at the moment is a uh, ongoing Kickstarter uh, for Cubicle 7 with respect to uh, the uh, Broken Weave. Uh, would you like to tell us a bit more about that, please? Absolutely. It's where my head is fully submerged at the moment. Uh, so Broken Weave, it is our new... Um, post-apocalyptic tragic fantasy role-playing game um, that is compatible with uh, Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition um, but also forward compatible with our own new uh, D20 system um, which is it's currently codenamed C7 D20 um, so which is going to use like the foundational rules of uh, D and D five e, um, but then build upon it with our own um, sort of various mechanics, systems, streamlines in some places. So, uh, yeah, Broken Weave is uh, our uh, our big Kickstarter at the moment. We launched uh, actually. You've caught us not too long after we've hit the twenty four hour mark, mm. um, and response has been overwhelming. Um, I think we we funded in less than an hour. 
uh, which was amazing. And we were already, I think, over four five hundred percent funded at this point. And we're knocking stretch goals down a lot faster than I anticipated. So <laughs> there's been some degree of panic. It's like, oh, gosh, we need more stretch goals mm. like now. Uh, and uh, we've been uh, scrambling away and getting them all ready. And I've been doing nothing but writing updates and answering questions and comments for the last 24 hours. So it's been quite a wild ride that you've caught me at the very beginning of. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, at time of recording, you are fractions of, of pounds or dollars, depending on, on currency uh, of use, under the, the 40,000 pounds funded mark, uh, pushing on and uh, sort of, as you say, releasing updates. So if someone was to go and back this post post-apocalyptic 5e based uh broken weave game and setting this broken world setting what would they get for backing at, at sort of each of the tiers oh my gosh well we do have quite a few tiers um our most basic entry level is obviously you can back um to get like the pdf of the the book itself you can get a hardback version of the book um, and then we also have a collector's edition, uh, which is lovely, uh, full leather, heat treated, um, embossed with like our big broken moon and everything on there. It's a very beautiful collector's edition. Um, anyone who has seen the Soulbound collector's edition, mm. it's going to be quite similar in that regard, really beautiful feeling things. So we've got those. And then after that, there's just, we've got a lot of really fun add ons to go on to it. So there's a beautiful GM screen. Um, which is going to be getting um, uh, all that's going to be all done with all the sort of like information and cheat sheets and everything on the back. Um, we've got our deck of broken things, which is my personal favorite <laughs> um, as uh, one of the, the big concepts with broken weave is this idea that um, magic is broken and the gods are dead and that kind of, caused an apocalyptic event where time and space no longer makes sense because it's kind of like magic is like a fundamental pillar of reality akin mm. to physics mm. so everything goes a bit weird and wonky um and uh, you can encounter landscapes that are twisted and non-euclidean or don't adhere to the natural flow of time and space um, and you encounter creatures that have been affected by decay, that have been twisted and changed and corrupted in uncanny and tragic ways. So the Deck of Broken Things is this little 20 euro deck of um, 52 uh, playing card sized cards. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a GM at the table, uh, you can essentially take any 5e compatible creature, monster, whatever, um, and take a stat block and then very quickly draw one, two, three, however many you like modifiers to it to make it like a broken weave monster. So a basic deer might, you know, have a like mournful cry mm. uh, that it's and whatnot, or you could take some great dragon or wyvern and its skin will be iridescent gemstones and, you know, it might, you know, weep just constantly or yeah. whatever trying to get those sort of um really dark fantasy tragic vibes about everything which if you've played any of like the sort of dark souls elden ring um sort of games it's that vibe that we go for with all mm -hmm. the monsters and the decay and everything um, and then the same goes for uh, environments as well the the cards can be used to twist and change environments to make them into surreal landscapes where you know you might see glimpses of future selves or gravity might no longer be a hundred percent all there and changes up the battlefield and whatnot so i do i do love the deck of broken things it's a, it's a good little add-on um what other add-ons have we got we've got custom dice uh, which are like nice metal dice uh dice trays and uh, we've got um working with all rolled up again which we did on our previous kickstarter uh, uncharted journeys um and that's a sort of it's like a it's like a, a dice bag taken to the extremes where it rolls up into a sort of like bedroll type thing mm. there's space for dice pens tokens markers everything you can imagine um and uh gosh i think that's everything i think oh. that's it all off the top of my head but definitely check out the kickstart we have a bunch of different tiers 
Um, you know, if you really want to, if you, if you feel like you want to drop a thousand dollars, you can get a custom character or a monster in there. Nice. <laughs> we, we've, uh, you know, we've had we've had one person take that so far. There's always at least a couple. <laughs> yeah, no, that's amazing. Uh, there'll definitely be a link to the Kickstarter uh, in the description below this podcast. So please scroll down, and we'll, we'll put a few more links in there in a moment. But you mentioned you mentioned a few things I really want to touch on: uh, the Kickstarter, the introduction video is very thematic it's it's beautifully made and narrated and it has this nightmare is that the correct description of the the uh, decayed owl owl bear type creature oh, yes. um mm. so what has it been like sort of fleshing out this world that sort of is seeping into this decay uh you mentioned dark souls and elden ring are sort of touchstones for this this sort of environment um and play style what has it been like sort of fleshing out that world and sort of trying to balance that with the hope and the decay yeah so we took a really different approach to developing broken weave than we would normally uh, normally with most sort of uh, ttrpg projects you tend to find that it's the writers and the designers that sit down and they conceptualize ideas, they write ideas down, and then they bring on artists to depict, you know, their visuals. So they'll say, oh, I've got this idea for this monster, or this character, or this environment, hmm. and then they'll describe it to the artists. With Broken Weave, we wanted to try and really have an art-led project. Okay. So we cool. set out, we had this original concept and Emmett Byrne, our creative director, mm. had this concept of what if you took a high fantasy world, so it could be any of these kind of fantasy worlds you're used to. It could be Faerun, it could be uh, Middle Earth, mm. it could be any of these sort of, you know, there's elves, dwarves, humans and whatnot. There's magic spells and sorcerers and dark lords and everything. But what happens to that world if all the gods die and magic breaks and the world goes very strange? Mm. And that was just what we handed to all our artists, our in-house artists. And we said, go have fun. <laughs> um, and they entered a very intense, um, like, few weeks of concepting. Okay. And if you, you can see on our website, we have a, we've been putting up developer diaries, blogs, mm. where we've been sharing a lot of the images from this concept stage and even then that's a fracture of what they created they went wild with their creativity reimagining creatures and monsters and environments and um, all these sorts of things like I, I believe even the concept you know we came up with the original idea of the gods are dead mm. but it took one of the artists drawing a giant dead corpse of a god on the horizon for us to go that's that's great mm. So we went through this intense period of visual creativity and letting the artists sort of uh, explore aesthetics and vibes and whatnot. Um, and then we refined that down. And it was only then that we started bringing in like sort of the writing team. So the artists would have this really tragic, wonderful looking creature. And then it was the writers who were like, okay, time to make a story for this character. Yeah. What is this character? And working with the artists in that way. So it's led to a really visually distinctive, I feel, setting. Um, that's uh, sort of really just just run through with all the artists' creativities and interpretations. Um, yeah, so really good fun. Yeah, and you mentioned the characters, and uh, the book provides uh, five classes for survivors yes. i don't know if adventures is the right word but survivors in this world um mm -hmm. to to yeah. sort of embody um ranging from the sage uh the warden the maker the seeker and the speaker seeker speaker yes um so how mm -hmm. do they sort of fit in with the the narrative of the game and and where where can our player characters go to, to sort of have a home base within this world, somewhere of, of sanctuary. Yeah, so um, at the heart of every Broken Weave game, uh, you have a haven, essentially. This is a post-apocalyptic world where there's this arcane entropy called decay that eats away at everything. It eats away at time, it eats away at space, it eats away at your memories, it eats away at 
your literal body cursing you and twisting you into its strange and monstrous forms. And the only way that people have discovered to fend this off is to build hope. Capital H, hope, is a, a physical, an arcane force that can be generated when people come together and build community and memories and everything. So people band together and build havens, which are small settlements. They rarely get above more than like a couple of hundred to a thousand people, even at their largest. This is still very post-apocalyptic. Mm. Um, but they come together into these havens. And one of the big selling points of the game is that the haven is a character unto itself. We recommend normally that you all sit down and generate your haven before you even make your characters. Because the Haven is like the legacy. It's the it's the main character of the game, almost. Okay. Um, it's as involved as making a character. You begin by rolling, okay, well, why was this settlement founded? What was our founders' ideas? What were the legacies they left behind? Um, and, uh, you know, what sort of biome are we in? What scarcities and abundances do we have? What strange and unusual features of the landscape um, can we see? Yeah. Is our settlement built near the corpse of a dead god or atop an ancient tomb or these sorts of things? Um, and you go all the way through to, okay, well, what's what kind of notable fashion <laughs> do the people in our haven have? Do we have distinctive food? What kind of things do we eat and harvest? Mm. Um, and then you also create a number of uh, like initial threats that the settlement's facing. It might be monsters or a famine or, or whatnot. Mm. Um, and then from there, once you have this really grounded place in the world, do you build your characters? Um, and it's this really great collaborative engagement process where everybody at the table sits down and gets involved in it. Um, so it gives everyone this really hefty anchor yeah. in the world. And everything about Broken Weave is all about protecting that haven. Yeah. Um, as your haven like grows and you develop it over time, it generates hope. Uh, which is this resource. So when your survivors uh, go out into the world to like deal with a crisis, like, oh, there's a monster approaching, we need to find a way to divert it, or there's a famine and we hear rumors that there's an artifact that could cure it or whatever. Mm. Um, they gather up people from the Haven. So they're not strictly, you know, they're not career adventurers. They are your average Haven um, sort of people. They get together and they carry the hope of the settlement with them. Um, and in a world where there's no magic around, <laughs> magic is a corrupting, horrible influence and the gods aren't coming to save you because they're all dead. Hope is about the only thing you can rely on. It's a resource that you can burn when times are dire to overcome uh, like insane odds or cheat death or stand back up when you should fall and mm. all that sort of stuff. So it's it's really thematically powerful to use. Um, and it means that even when you're out in the middle of crazy prog rock album covered <laughs> twisted landscapes facing a, a deer with 10 eyes that screams the cries of a thousand dead worlds, you're still thinking of your little home <laughs> that you're doing it all to protect. That's heavy stuff. Um, it is. Yeah, it's great. It's everything about it has got this air of tragedy about it. Mm. And even like when you generate your characters, uh, we've got this new system called the life path system. So you generate yes. your haven and then you go and you generate your characters and it's uh, you run through essentially the key experiences of your characters. So maybe you recovered from like a, a plague or an illness when you were young. So you get plus one constitution or, okay. you know, you managed to broker a peace deal between uh, two like rival families, plus one charisma or like, mm. a, like proficiency in uh, persuasion and things like that. And your character sort of organically is built out of this, and then you pick your class to go with that. Um, and uh, you know you can randomly generate all this stuff, or you can pick it. You know it's all it's all in there. And uh, yeah, with each of these key experiences, um, you also generate a memoria, which is a small trinket. It's something. Because decay eats at memories, people know they have to protect them. And mm. the best way to protect a memory from decay is to remember it and have something physical. Yeah, makes so sense. people 
you know, if you if you look at the art for our characters, they're all covered in trinkets, mm. medallions, uh, like ribbons and all this sort of stuff. And these are all memoria. So uh, uh, you have all your key experiences and you collect this little ha- um, like handful of memoria. And then whenever you go out into the big scary world, if uh, decay starts to eat away at you, the GM can point to one of your memoria and say you no longer remember what that represents. And your your character's memories erode, and you mm. still have the bonuses from it. So, for example, if you had a mentor back home who taught you how to whittle wood, so you have like you know a woodmaker's tool proficiency, it's like you can still use the tools, but you no longer remember who taught you them. You no longer remember your mentor's face, and it's this great sort of hope versus decay mm. um, narrative that's happening with everyone at the table all the time. As you go out and you're, you know, anytime you leave the haven, you're doing it in this almost self-sacrificial way where you might never return or you might, you'll probably definitely not return the same. Um, And what does that do to characters over the long run is just such incredible role play fodder. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And you mentioned sort of going out into this this post-apocalyptic world, leaving hope, leaving uh, the haven. Um, And you've, uh, within the book have brought across the the travel mechanics from um, uncharted journeys so how does how is that sort of amplified and uh, in, i won't say improve the experience but i'm going to use it now i've said it improve the experience of travel uh, from uncharted journeys into uh, broken weave yeah well uncharted journeys and by extension broken weave they are starting to build up this language that we are going to be cementing with uh, C7 D20 when it mm-hmm. comes out later on in the year. These are the branches that we are starting to build upon, the pillars of our traditional uh, sort of D&D 5e adventures that have been previously neglected or could do with like streamlining and just, you know, modernizing. Mm. Um, so the travel rules as they are in Broken Weave are very, very similar to those found in Uncharted Journeys. And the whole goal with those for the people who weren't, you know, tapped into that particular Kickstarter or book was to make the journey just as important as the destination. It was, you know, it was originally made... Uh, in uh, Adventures in Middle Earth, which obviously mm. anyone who knows all the Tolkien, Lord of the Rings, the journey is the adventure there. Yeah. It's, so these journey rules are all about creating these really exciting um, adventures uh, where travel is like such an important aspect and the encounters along the way and everything. Um, so we refine them in Uncharted Journeys and then they're modified slightly for Broken Weave just because time and space are strange and surreal so in uncharted journeys normally one of the key aspects is you would dictate the time it would take you to get to your destination and then you to set out on your adventure Mm. and that dictates how many encounters you have and all these sorts of things and how tiring the journey is but with decay messing with that then time can stretch or shorten depending on how bad decay is Mm. um so if anyone has picked up Adventures in Middle Earth or Uncharted Journeys, you, you kind of know what you're getting in for. Um, it's just more of that. And then again, once we get into like the core um, C7020 rules, that's one of those areas that will be like a big selling point for us. It's looking at these other things. So we've got like that and we've got the travel rules for Uncharted Journeys. We have Life Path and everything from Broken Weave is like a really big thing, mm-hmm. uh, which we're looking to build up again this language. Um, and we're also looking at uh, like Victoriana uh, fifth edition is another is like our next big 5e uh, setting uh, and uh, that's very investigation heavy that's steampunk Victorian era stuff and that's very nice. almost Sherlock Holmes style so you mm. can expect similar we're going to be really looking at this investigation pillar of fifth edition which is normally resolved with like role perception uh you know things like that and really like fleshing out how that works yeah um, and we did a similar thing with doctors and daleks which was our doctor who fifth edition um version and uh, everyone said it couldn't be done we said you can't make a game about non-violence in a game that's primarily about <laughs> about hitting things with swords but we did yeah. it like non-violent 
um, conflict resolution in mm. Doctor Who was like a huge thing uh, that we built up and it works really well. So that's another thing that we'll be looking to refine and integrate into C7D20. Yeah, so much. So it's, you know, Sorry, go on. No, it's just, like I say, it's just all building up this language, this tool set of um, enhancements and advancements and everything so that your D&D games are no longer uh, just about going into dungeons and hitting goblins until they spit up XP and gold. <laughs> mm, which is fair and, and certainly something that um, I myself have been looking to, to sort of shift away from the sort of the, the XP bags of of nondescript enemies and things like that and try and bring a, a, a true experience to to players and, and groups that are, that i run for which is uh fantastic and i'm, I'm really looking forward to it uh, before we step into uh, other uh forthcoming releases and and uh current lines that that you yourself have worked on for cubicle seven uh where can we find yourself and cubicle seven online uh and other social media sites yeah, so Cubicle 7 is fairly easy to find. You look for Cubicle 7, you'll find us on Instagram, you'll find us on Twitter, um, you'll find us, uh, we've got our website, obviously, cubicle7games.com, um, and uh, obviously we have the big Broken Weave Kickstarter right now. If you search for Broken Weave Kickstarter uh, on, you know, on Kickstarter or on Google or whatever, you'll find us. We're only day one of uh, 22 as of recording, so... Uh, hopefully by the time this goes out and everything you'll still be able to hop on check out the kickstarter if you're interested or want to see more check out the behind the scenes blogs if you're really wanting to to deep dive in and see all these extra bits and pieces we could sit and talk about broken weave and all of its wonderful tragic dark fantasy goodness for hours on end but <laughs> i'll save you that and um, so yeah if you're looking for Myself specifically, you can just find me. I am very imaginatively just at Elaine Lithgow on Twitter. It's probably the best place to locate me. As much as that site continues to slowly but surely crumble apart, <laughs> um, I'll be, I'll still be hanging onto the railings as the mm. Titanic slowly goes sinks under. So uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll see what happens. So that's a good place to find me for now. Uh, I will make sure there are links. Uh to yourself cubicle seven uh did you which we'll, we'll touch back on in, in a little bit uh the kickstarter and uh all the the sort of the good things that yourself and cubicle seven and did you working on down in the description below and anything else we mentioned during the course of this interview that, that sort of flags up as something that really needs a link um but cubicle seven seem to have so many things running through the mill it's it's an impressive production uh, set up uh, Broken Weave, the Kickstarter we've spoken so much about, you mentioned Wrath and Glory and Soulbound both with forthcoming releases uh, so what has it been like to work within the Warhammer umbrella before we sort of zero down on the on the respective mm -hmm. IPs Yeah, it's been great, like I was always a huge fan of Warhammer and everything actually my first role playing game uh, was uh, like the old Inquisitor skirmish game, I technically still count as a role playing game <laughs> Um, and then going into Dark Heresy and all these sort of things. So, and that was when I was young, um, which is funny because <laughs> we do have some writers in our in house team who worked on the original Dark Heresy. Um, and I, uh, uh, you know, I, I, every now and then I'll be like, oh man, I remember playing these when I was young. And they're just like, oh, make me feel old. Why don't you? Oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, it was always one of these things where I was always like big into Warhammer and, and all of those uh, role playing games and, and the I'm a big one for the skirmish games. I love me a good Warhammer as they used to be called specialist games. Mm -hmm. Your Necromundas, Mordheim will forever live in my heart uh, for the number of great memories I have in that cursed sea, um, and uh, all these other uh, wonderful games over the years. Fleet Gothic, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm waxing lyrical and fading off into a thousand year stare of specialist <laughs> games long past. Um, and uh, so finally, like, you know, eventually just finding myself um, working with Cubicle 7, working on those licenses was very surreal mm. for a time. Um, I remember, I think the one that hit me the most was um, when I was writing Champions of Order which was a character options expansion for Age of Sigmar Soulbound. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, I found myself, I was writing one of these chapters and it was a chapter about the origins of the Soulbound Order and how they came to be. And uh, they're intrinsically tied to the gods of that system, which is a very, for those who aren't aware, Greek pantheon type mm. scenario where you have named characterful gods who have machinations and relationships and interactions and all sorts of stuff. And uh, I found myself sitting down and writing how these characters were interacting in the context of the Soulbound. And where, you know, so Sigmar said this and went to this god and then this god rebuked them and they did this and then this one agreed but then did a sneaky thing over here and everything <laughs> and it was probably the most scary thing i've written to date really? because it's the equivalent of playing with like superman or whatever right. it's these yes, multi-million dollar ip characters and you're you're writing about them you're writing canonical things that they did mm. um and events that transpired and everything and it's very scary um and a big a big sort of wake up call of oh oh this is actually a thing that's happening and uh, oh my gosh if i was to go back in time and tell my younger self like hey you're gonna get to write like lore and all that sort of stuff for these settings i'd be like nah <laughs> <laughs> uh so very humbling i would say um and also just sort of uh being able to put things out in the world um, for these like beloved franchises and have the the community really support and love them and mm. everything is just like it's it's great you, you know it's so humbling yeah yeah just <laughs> really really good really great i'm just gonna keep saying yeah that's great well it, it is i mean with respect to we'll, we'll zero in on um warhammer age of sigma soulbound for a few minutes there's so many each of the releases which i have purchased and i really should learn to sort of control myself but uh from the the starter set uh the core rule book uh there is the order of um uh, the order of you know champions of order uh there is the champions of death champions of destruction there's mm -hmm. uh campaign books i've got it open just over my shoulder shadows in the mist blackened earth is the newest one uh and uh, lots of there's a couple of there's crash and burn which is a free pdf available from the cubicle 7 website uh and there's a few others so please go and check it out it is it's it's a fantastic system that's what's part of what's drawn me across is the game mechanics behind the system but the law the love uh that, that is clearly put into each of these releases um is is amazing and uh for anyone that is not aware it's a sort of d6 dice ball system i think is the first way of describing both Soulbound and Wrath and Glory. They, they have their own respective mechanics, but effectively they are D6 dice. Yeah, they're um, with um, both Soulbound and, and Wrath and Glory. There's that sort of idea, Soulbound especially, of um, this really high power... How do you do high power level play while keeping mm. combat and everything really slick um, and really like fast and streamlined? Because um, it's something that myself and a bunch of other people on the dev team and everything we love big dramatic tactical battles but we don't want them to take five hours mm -hmm. um so that was like one of the big design goals and everything going in with soulbound was uh, uh you know you want to be able to have your stormcast eternal or whatever charge into a swarm of skaven and you know take care of like you know, five, six, seven of them per attack because that's the heavy metal mm. sort of high power leveled fantasy of Age of Sigmar Soulbound. Um, and the same goes for Wrath and Glory where, you know, you're, you're playing as like space marines in action movie type scenarios and everything. It's trying to um, give these like really nice like streamlined experiences. Um, and I think that's always, uh, it's definitely one of the things I think that's resonated a lot with the players of Soulbound especially. Mm. We always hear people saying that they pick it up and they're like, the system is so good. The combat system, the resolution, it's, um, you make, you know, one, one dice pool roll and that takes care of, of most of everything. Um, and we use zones to simplify uh, distance and movement and everything. Yeah. 
and uh, swarms are great. I love swarms. Mm -hmm. I love a, I love a good Skaven swarm and rolling in and rolling your dice and just like I deal ten damage. Okay, you you take you kill ten Skaven. Yeah. Just like okay, great. And then you just get to narratively describe I land in a big superhero pose, lightning fires out out of the thing, and you're like swinging your sword. And um, I always go back to that, uh, like the um uh like your marvel superheroes mm. style power level of these are your your big your big damn heroes doing big damn heroic things so i still and uh, wrath and glory are great fun to write for because you get to really embody that power fantasy and just give people these great big set pieces and uh, great encounters and you see the games being played and i run a, a huge amount at this point um for conventions and play testers and everything and everyone's always like just leaving with giant grins on their faces mm -hmm. just because of how liberating and kind of like fun it is to be able to just swing uh, and be big and powerful and then you know you'll mow through like 20 30 boys and then oh here comes the boss here mm -hmm. comes the mini boss and then that gives you some trouble and then you overcome that and yeah it's so much fun honestly <laughs> it's yeah i'm smiling and, and i know people can't see me smiling but i'm i'm smiling because i've really fallen for it and everything you've described there it, it just nails the experience perfectly and you know it's available in hard copy in pdf it's uh certain books are available for both franchises or both ips uh on foundry uh so you can play it online you can share that with with your gaming group and, and really get into that experience it is phenomenal and a soulbound sort of staying on that line has a coincidental almost sort of pr uh, product in the works with respect to Olfen Cairn. Make sure I've said that. Yep, Olfen Cairn, where it is the city on the edge of death, so very post apocalyptic, which mirrors but is not the same as Broken Weave, just sort of a touchstone back to that. Um, so, what's it been like bringing such a desolate place within the world of Soulbound to? Uh, to the players and the, the GMs out there. Oh yeah, Ulfenkarn has been great fun. Um, for those who are in tune with the uh, like the Warhammer Age of Sigmar, or the Warhammer games in general, uh, there was the the board game, uh, the the Warhammer Quest Cursed City, uh, which was a, a sort of narrative board game um, set in this city in the realm of death called Ulfenkarn. And it's uh, been ruled by a, a vampire lord called Radikar the Beast, Radikar the Wolf, depending on your particular time period. And uh, it's this city that has essentially been locked down and its inhabitants are just used to feed the vampiric overlords. It's policed by skeletal uh, minions and zombies and giant werewolf bats and all mm. this sort of good stuff. Um, and it's inc it's deliciously gothic and good fun. And yeah. um, if you're a big fan of, um, oh my gosh, Bloodborne, Castlevania, mm. these sorts of um, uh, like sort of thematic touchstones are all there. Um, and so it's with Ulfen Karn, we're still using the Soulbound engines, so the combat is still really fast and immediate. Um, but the character power level is just lower. So mm. normally with a Soulbound character, you build them with, say, 35 XP, maybe 40 if you're a Stormcast Eternal. Um, uh, but with our Ulfenkarn, as we call them, Grim and Perilous characters, you build them with 20, 25 XP. They are much uh, sort of weaker. Mm. Uh, they have to think and play a lot more tactical because suddenly you cannot run into the swarm of 20 skeleton warriors that are charging mm. towards you one of them is actually dangerous because <laughs> you're no longer god chosen like divine magic infused demigod heroes you are a guy with a gun who has a beef with radicar um and you're trying to save the day or save mm. some people or even just escape the city and uh, you know so that has been so much fun. It's one of maybe my favorite ways now of paying, playing like low powered heroes. Cause again, mm. the combat is just so immediate. It's almost even more immediate than core Soulbound, just because the numbers are all lower. Yeah. Um, it's a lot of the time. Uh, I feel like it really encourages people to play with like stealth because it's like whoever gets hit first is going down in a lot of ways sometimes. <laughs> 
like if you sneak up on uh, like an orphan watch, like a guard or whatever, if you yeah. don't get the drop on them, they can turn around and stab you and that's half your health gone. Mm. Um, and you're like, oh no. <laughs> um, and uh, you don't have soul fire, no, no cheating and calling on the power yeah. within to get back up. It's uh, it's great fun. Um, I think uh, we did one play test where it was uh, a the, the group were trying to essentially kindle uh, an uprising to gather people to rise up against uh, Radikar and then I had uh, a couple of Wolf and Watch and a single low-ranking vampire walk into the scene and only one person, one player out of five left that scene alive Ooh, wow. um, and it was it was it all took place in a big opera house it was very dramatic, it was great fun um, and yeah, so it can be very, very uh, very deadly, but still very, very quick and yeah. fast paced. So, yeah, it's, it's really, really good fun uh, to, to play around with. Well, if uh, those listening want to get a, a, a basically an, an early tryout of this sort of grim, grim and dark or grim dark approach, you can go on to it. I'm going to plug it because I've downloaded it and I think it's a great one. I'm looking forward to running it probably for Halloween. Uh, you can download Vosheim's Holdouts, which is the precursor to the events in Olfen Khan. Um, it reads beautifully. I can't wait to run it for a group for probably uh, Halloween or, or something around that sort of spoopy season um, and sort of really dive into that because that sets up the, this one immediately follows the other effectively, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Bossheim's Holdouts was so much fun to write. It was myself and Sam Taylor. Uh, we just got let loose on that. It was our Halloween adventure for last year. Um, and uh, yeah, it's set during the period, the the night where Radikar rises up and takes over the city mm. uh, during an event known as the Necroquake, um, which was this massive, big necromatic ritual that caused all the dead to rise up and attack the living and whatnot. And obviously in a city in the land of the dead, that's very bad. Mm -hmm. So you play a handful of town guard um, who are caught in the middle of all this and you have the promise that if you can just hold out until morning, there's a boat coming to save you. Um, and it's uh, you, you hold out, essentially, you are Vosheim's holdouts and you have to try and survive the night during uh, Mornhold's, as it was originally known as Mornhold before it became Ulfenkarn, uh, their worst night. And it's a wonderful, in a lot of ways, homage to John Romero, uh, Night of the Living Dead, mm. um, all those sorts of great like zombie horror movies. Uh, where people have to like barricade themselves up and just try and survive the night. And uh, yes, it has a, an almost complete example of the Grim and Perilous rules that you can expect for uh, the full Wolfenkarn release. Um, obviously, Wolfenkarn has uh, a lot more advanced character creation options to let you create all these different classes and everything. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, if you want a good sneak peek and a self-contained a little adventure which can lead on you know if your characters survive Vosheim's holdouts maybe they can go on to to play in a full Ulfenkarn campaign or maybe if you're playing an Ulfenkarn campaign you can just come upon the undead corpses of those characters you played in that one shot that time <laughs> so, yeah. I mean if if you want to play the the flip side of that um and I've, I've grabbed it off the stack because these soulbound hard copy books with the the detailing uh on the from the artwork and the, the reliefs are, are so beautiful i'm so glad i picked these up um if you want to play the flip side of this uh then pick up champions of death and you could potentially play this from the opposite side but that's that's an option for you and your uh gm to discuss yeah absolutely it's definitely something we have thought about a lot because champions of death is already out in hardback and everything and that gives you options for playing as vampires or mm. whites which are like sentient skeletons or even ghosts and whatnot um and yeah the idea of letting people take because often karn is largely a city guide it's really really in depth if people mm. know any of our books from wuffrup uh, warhammer fantasy role-playing game um like mittenheim and whatnot um it's a really really in-depth city guide and um, with lots of locations and we also have a bunch of big dungeon locations in there so 
um, like the Evan Citadel, which is Radicar's seat of power, which is this big mega dungeon, mm. um, and all these other places. So um, there's lots of character options in there and talents and everything. But if you want, you could still turn around and say, well, we have Champions of Death. Let's play as the vampires. Nice. Or, you know, you know, mm. everyone knows that vampires love to backstab. Maybe you could be some vampires who want to overthrow Radicar or... Maybe your characters in the course of playing in Ulfenkarn might get turned into vampires or die and turn into skeletons. You know, who knows? The uh, the options are, are near endless. And uh, we, we think about that a lot when, when we're writing it. And so it's it's really great fun. I'm honestly looking forward to Ulfenkarn so much. <laughs> so am I now. I was before, but I'm even more so now. Uh, and just to, to sort of, pay the balance across to the 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 40k wrath and glory side there's a a, a new release coming out for that uh which is threat assessment zeno xenos 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 yeah xenos yeah. uh which uh are you able to give us a, a quick pre say of what we can expect from from that particular book uh yeah i haven't honestly had a huge like involvement in threat assessment xenos actually there's a there's a great team working on that one um, so I'm going to have to refer to you, refer you to the blog and whatnot, uh, the website to have a look at that because I wouldn't want to say anything that hasn't already been announced uh, <laughs> and put my foot in my mouth. <laughs> I could, I can see them now glaring at me across the screen mentally, mm. just like don't you dare say anything. Which is um, so uh, I'll, uh, yeah. I'll refer you to that one, but that one's on the way very shortly. I know people have been looking forward to it because. Mm more uh everyone loves the xenos and, and 40k they're they're great so lots of lots more options and everything for that be fantastic yeah I'll, I'll, again i'll put a link to the uh a specific blog post for that so people can then follow it on or, or backtrack and follow its development from earlier stages uh one thing you you are and have been involved with is uh the new uh correct me if i'm wrong d100 system the imperium maledictum which is also uh, having yes. blog updates released. Uh, so how does that shift the focus within the Warhammer 40k setting that Wrath and Glory maybe does not cover yeah. in that respect? So if you think of Wrath and Glory as a high-octane action movie directed by Michael Bay, um, then Imperial Maledictum is a gritty noir thriller uh, nice. down in the gutter. In the same way that Warhammer Fantasy role-playing game, as people know, is quite popular when we do the fourth edition of it, where you play pig farmers and mm. you know rat catchers and these sorts of things, really grim and perilous, low-powered characters, um, is a D100 system that we have. And then Soulbound is this high-powered demigod-type characters, kicking ass and taking names. It's the same parallel between Wrath and Glory and Imperial Maledictum. Okay. So Wrath and Glory... You're playing as space marines, you're kicking indoors and, and being heroes and whatnot. Imperial Maledictum is you are a low-ranking member of the Adeptus Ministratum or something who has been roped in by a patron to go investigate some stuff or cover something up or whatever. And uh, if someone pulls a stub gun out on you, uh, you dive for cover because <laughs> you're one you're one bullet away from losing an eye or an arm or whatever. Mm. And if someone pulls a bolt gun on you, then you scream and dive for cover really loud because <laughs> everything's about to get really messy really fast. Um, so uh, it's yeah, it's definitely it's more investigative. Mm. It's more noir and gritty and it really dives deep into the uh, the machinations of the imperium you're less dealing with like you know oh, we're gonna go out and fight tyranids it's more oh well the you know adeptus mechanicus and the adeptus uh, like uh, arbites or whatever are are like having some friction and tension um and uh, you're trying to navigate these systems okay. without and investigate without getting yourself killed. Because one of the when we were first concepting it, one of the big touchstones for myself was I want operating within the Imperium to feel like saying the wrong thing to the wrong person is just as deadly as a bolt pistol to the head. Yeah, it's very factional. It's very mm -hmm. influence based. You know, you are an agent for a patron, and your patron could be a member of the ecclesiarchy, 
they could be potentially an inquisitor they could be um even a gang boss you can play criminals and whatnot where you have like criminal um uh, patrons Mm -hmm. and uh it's all about if i say the wrong thing to the wrong person i am going to get destroyed (laughs) (laughs) operating within the archaic machinery of the imperium is is a deadly Mm -hmm. thing so you're trying to forward the the machinations and the plots of your patron without getting yourself killed in the process uh so uh, yeah it's 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 a very different very dark very gritty experience um, and it's also one i'm incredibly excited to go on obviously as i as i mentioned uh my first games were the inquisitor skirmish game and then going into the fantasy flight dark heresy and mm. um, only war and all these sorts of games and Imperial Maledictum is very much a spiritual successor to those D100 systems. Um, with uh, sort of taking um, the Wolfrup 4E D100 system and then yeah. building on that to, to make it work for the 41st millennium and all its skulls and grim darkness. Oh, it sounds amazing. I'm very intrigued by it. And I was intrigued, again, I'm excited for Ulfram Khan because I, I, I love soulbound and I, I love where where you've taken that setting with, with that style of characters and all the releases with the big bombastic uh stormcast eternals but this deeper darker noir the end of my the enemy of my enemy is probably still my enemy but we might be sort of friendly relations before you shoot me in the back or something i'm, I'm not really sure um within the the 40k setting sounds so exciting and so gritty and and i just love it so i'm really looking forward for that to come out do we have a vague release schedule for that particular game to come out i am going to hedge my bets and say soon soon (laughs) soon (laughs) soon expect it Uh, obviously as with all our uh, cubicle 7 games we release the pdf uh, when the game goes up for pre-order mm. so you can pre-order the physical copy and you get the pdf right away and you can start playing and then the books go to print and all that sort of stuff so pdf should be soon soon <laughs> keep an eye out uh, on the blog and everything for, for oh, time following that one no perfect uh, uh we mentioned right at the start and i did say we come back to it are we expecting anything new from digi sprite moving forward you mentioned the three games uh before we started recording you mentioned going to uh cons before uh are we expect to see more digi sprite coming up in the future yeah digi sprite again for for those who haven't seen the first episode or whatever um was our our little three-person team uh we make our our little board games we put them up on kickstarter and uh there there are wonderful little little passion projects and uh we had three games so far we went into a little bit of a hibernation during the lockdown since we primarily made board games um i think like our biggest thing was we had adventure mart on tabletop simulator um and that actually did incredibly well for mm-hmm. us over the the pandemic because the, the folk over at tabletop simulator like put together a really nice um adventure mart environment you can go into and uh, and whatnot so uh that's been really good for us uh we went back to our first con which was tabletop scotland last year um and that was incredible it was the first time we had been in front of people again mm. um and uh, we had all our three games because we had kickstarted familiar alchemy our most recent game during the pandemic and again it was the first time we had physical copies to sell to people and uh, yeah, we did incredibly well <laughs> during Tabletop Scotland. So that was really encouraging because um, I think like a lot of really small companies during the pandemic, you know, we kind of, we just, we had to go into hibernation for a while. We couldn't necessarily keep uh, like trucking away when, when conventions and people weren't buying board games because obviously yeah. people can't share like a room with, with uh, each other. So that's been really good. We've definitely got other plans. Uh, we announced quite a while back now uh, that we were looking at doing the uh, a tabletop role playing game version of Adventure Mart, <laughs> where uh, for for those who don't know Adventure Mart, it's a uh, um, a sort of fun uh, fantasy game where you play as um, sort of anthropomorphic animals. Think Animal Crossing, 
um, sort of characters uh, running uh, a 7-Eleven designed for adventurers uh, and whatnot. So you're selling people magic potions and swords and it's always uh, hijinks ensue. So it's sort of a, a, a sort of almost the TTRPG plays a lot like one of these like animated uh, like sitcoms mm. um, sort of your your kind of wacky Rick and Morty sort of stuff where, you know, oh, a, a portal opens up in aisle three and it spits out a bunch of adventurers that are now fighting a dragon and they're messing up <laughs> your display shelves and everything. And it's it's really great fun. We're continuing to develop that way mm. um, to ourselves and we'll, uh, we'll definitely be looking at trying to get that out at some point in the future. Um, wow. Yeah, so Digisprite, can t- there's still some life in Digisprite. She's still kicking away. <laughs> Great to hear. Great to hear. Uh, Elaine, we've covered uh, so many fantastic things, uh, and I'm, I'm so glad we've been able to sort of get across pretty much all the ones I was hoping to, to get to. Uh, is there anything that we haven't spoken about in the interview that you want to bring up just here at the end? Oh, my gosh. We do. Sometimes I forget just how much we're working on until we sit down and do like a rundown of everything. Mm. And I'm like, gosh, we do make a lot of books, don't we? Um, Fantastic. (laughs) They're all really good. Oh, thank you. We we put a lot of uh, passion and love into them. Um, Gosh, I can't I can't think of anything off the top of my head, honestly. Like, you know, I'm sure there's definitely things we're forgetting. We haven't touched on. Uh, Warhammer Fantasy role playing game too much, and um, I'm not I'm not hyper invest I'm not like hyper um, involved in those books, and I get yeah. a little bit for for one of the books and everything. But um, I know they've got some big books on the horizon, and people are really excited for those. And yeah, we're continuing to support Wrath and Glory as Imperial Maledictum comes out, and obviously now continuing to ramp up the C seventy twenty side of things. Mm. And, Gosh, there's so much going on, so, but I, but I do think we've we've covered the lion's share of everything. Well, I'd love to get you back when uh, code name C seven D twenty, if it remains that uh, as as its yeah. as its final name or or whatever it develops into. I'd love to get you back once uh, there are uh, there's that core system in place and it's released and and we can uh, yourself or Emmy or or any of the the cubicle 17 come on and uh discuss it with me i'd, I'd be honored yeah that'd be fantastic be great. i'm sure uh, it will be singing from the rooftops once uh once that core book is hitting uh, the kickstarter and everything yeah absolutely and uh again that'll be something i'll look to to back and, and support and shout out where i can 100 percent uh it's been such a pleasure elaine and i'm so glad uh, that you've been able to come back and join me and, and take me through these amazing releases uh would you like to remind everybody where they can find yourself and cubicle seven and digi sprite uh on the internet please yeah for myself you can find me as mentioned most likely at uh, at la Mithko on twitter and that's the best place to find me cubicle seven you can find them on all the good socials and um, cubicle seven games and um, on twitter instagram uh, check out the blog check out the kickstarter for Broken Weave. Uh, as for Digisprite, we are at Team Digisprite on Twitter, and uh, our website and everything is there as well. You can go in and, and have a look and see what we're up to. Amazing. I will put links down in the description below. Please scroll down, support the link, support the Kickstarter, support future projects from Cub- the Elaine, Digisprite, and Cubicle 7. Thank you so much for joining me. I look forward to speaking to you again. Always a pleasure. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to learn more about the show, then go to www snydersreturn.squarespace.com Alternatively, you can find us over on Twitter at Return Snyder. We have a link tree link in the description of this episode. And if you want to support us, come and join us over on Patreon and we also have a Discord server. Uh, please leave us a review because we'd love to learn how to improve the channel and provide better content out for, for those who are listening. Uh, until we uh, Until we speak again, thank you. <laughs>